like to officially welcome everybody to uh, our live Q&A. This is episode number eight, and uh, we'll be turning this into a podcast. And our second one with Mark, who's one of our regular facilitators for brain power training. And Mark, oh, you, you must have been working with us now for nearly 19 years, because mm -hmm. when you were first uh, leaving the RAF, at the Royal Australian Air Force, and um, are living in Melbourne. Now that we've started, Mark, um, what would you say, what's the first thing you've observed that COVID has changed culture and how people are working and also how people feel about work? Yeah, that's actually a good point because it's enabled people to try something that perhaps they were cautious about. Um, and it's almost forced them to try it. Uh, and we're getting a lot more positive feedback uh, about flexible work hours, flexible working conditions uh, than ever before, particularly from management. And they were traditionally the ones that tended to oppose it. Yeah, it's funny that, isn't it? I, I think in the past, management would reluctantly allow someone to have one day a fortnight or one day a week working from home. And now it's... Uh, well, because we had a period where it was 100% working from home and now we're coming back gradually, it's sort of uh, resolving itself as being a preference for 50-50 in office and WFH working from home. Uh, do you think that's a positive thing? Absolutely, yeah. Um, in the past, it was almost like, I'll allow you that one day a fortnight and I know I'll get no productivity from you, but that's my little bonus to you. Uh, whereas now that we're actually having to do this properly, we're actually having to say, how am I going to empower my people to be productive? Uh, and hidden in what you just said, Mark, is that it sounds like there was a lack of trust on behalf of uh, uh, leaders in the past. They assumed that if people were at home, they wouldn't be working as productively. Spot on. And I'll, I'll, um, I'll introduce some terminology and we can use both. Leaders and managers. Oh, uh, okay. Leaders have always been good with this. Right. Managers feared not being able to manage people. Okay, so yeah, whatever term you use kind of defines how you approach the role. And mm -hmm. I prefer to use leader because that's really the ideal in the workplace. And in fact, that's probably uh, the, uh, the third trend of this report, which um, I did actually print off, and if anybody wants the link, just uh, email me and I'll send you the link. But uh, most people I've given the link to anyway. The resetting normal, defining the new era of work. That people now expect a high EQ leader. Yeah. Um, and when I talk to people, I, I often get them to try to differentiate what is the difference between a leader and a manager. And over and over again, uh, we come up with the definition, though, a leader is somebody who moves you forward. They take you into the future. They have a vision um, and they're uh, moving people willingly in that direction. A manager tends to organise. They schedule, right. they roster, they put in place policy, rules and systems. Um, and we're not saying one is better than the other. Uh, what we're saying is that there perhaps has been an over-reliance on management in the past um, and true leadership was only expected from the top one or two in an organisation. Well, the workers are saying the opposite. They're saying that I want my frontline manager to become a frontline leader. I want my team manager to be a team leader. I still want them to organize me. I still want schedules and rosters and I still want resources, but I want to be led as well. I want to buy into the business. And one of the things that from my experience with you over 19 years, Mark, uh, is you explained to me that in the, in the Royal Australian Air Force, while there are orders, there's an element of perception of choice yes. and it's all in the languaging. So uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, people often hear Air Force, they think a very transactional style of leadership, similar to the army. Uh, in a transactional style, if you give me your time, I will give you a salary. If you follow my rules, I will give you job security. So there's always a transaction occurring uh, in there. With transformational leadership, which is what the Royal Australian Air Force has moved to and modern businesses are using, is that transformational leaders are leaders I look up to. I respect, I admire, and I want to become like them. 
Um, I understand the journey. I understand that I'm a valuable contributor to the journey that we're on. Um, and therefore, I don't have to overly rely on transactions to get my people to arrive at that destination. One of the things, uh, one of the earlier uh, live Q&As that we ran was the danger of managers micromanaging people working remotely. Um, what uh, have you have you got any observations around? Has that improved or because over time because there's been pushback by the people working from home saying you don't need to check on me quite so much or or are, are managers just as bad as they ever were? I mean, are they learning? <laughs> um, the first thing is we're expected to do both in our job. We're expected to be a manager and a leader, but one of them comes naturally. So it's a bit like having a left hand and a right hand. One of them is smooth and fluid and it works well for me. The other one, I have to use the tongue of concentration <laughs> to make it work. Um, therefore, when I'm put under pressure, I prefer to use the one that comes more naturally. Um, so at the moment, a lot of managers are resorting to extreme management to manage their people. Uh, so in fact, whilst we would hope it would get better, um, in many cases, the micromanager has got even more micro. They're just looking for ways to do micromanagement remotely. Mm, yes. One of the things that um, you've delivered for us is the eight good behaviours of a manager. And a lot of it was around empathy and support and knowing enough about the appropriately about the home life of your of your direct reports that they felt that you had support and you were interested in them and also interested in their career development. Um, is that, do you think those aspects of high EQ leadership is more important than ever now? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. People want their leader now and we'll use leader manager interchangeably because in the business, you may be called a team leader or you may be called an area manager, but the truth is you're expected to do both. Uh, but people want to see more leadership. They want to see somebody who will coach them and develop them and grow them. Um, that's not in the manager's schedule quite often. Mm. Performance reviews are, but not actually investing in my people. Emerging is this whole concept of, um, of having one-on-ones, scheduling one-on-ones, and that definitely is a trend. Would you agree? Absolutely. Um, and those one-on-ones are critical to getting to know your people, but also agreeing with them. Where are you at as a leader with them? What style of leadership are you using? Where do you want to get to next? And how are you going to change as a leader to enable them to grow? Very good point. Now, one of the other uh, trends that came through in the report was productivity not to be measured in hours, but to be measured by results. And of course, yes. uh, you've delivered time management for us and you've uh, often talk about uh, working to priority and focusing on the important rather than the urgent. Do you think the, the workplace will find it difficult to shift from that punching in your time and you know just keeping the seat warm versus focusing on productivity and maybe having an early mark, what's, what's called leaving early, because you got it all done. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that's one of the big things that workers are noticing is that, uh, and I've talked to a number of people um, in different industries who are all saying, um, I actually felt a bit guilty because I'm getting my work done in four, six hours at home. Um, and then what do I do? Now, if you add to that a manager who's checking how many keystrokes they do per hour, um, unless they get one of those little birds that pecks the key, uh, they're gonna look like they're actually not working. Whereas what they've identified is that two, three, four hours a day in their workplace was actually not important work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, in our um, earlier workshop, we talked about uh, a dear colleague of mine, uh, Angela, and Angela had got a new job um, and uh, after the 90 days, her boss came to see her and said, Angela, we love your work. We love what you're doing. Um, we want to keep you on. We only have one concern. And that is that you're taking a lot of time off. 
And she said, oh, absolutely I am. She said, what I do is I come to work each day and I do one important activity. And when I've got that important thing done for the day, I go home. And he was almost horrified. He said, you can't do that. And she said, no, no, I want you to stop and think. Most of these people will not achieve one important thing this week. I do one important thing every day. She said, I'm happy to conform and become like them, or I can continue to do important things for this business. I'll give you time to think about it. Um, slightly cheeky, Angela. Um, the next day he came back to her and said, you're right, Angela, keep going. Yeah. And Angela's now trying to get her important thing done by morning tea so she can go home. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So um, the uh, focusing on the important rather than uh, the non-essential or even once upon a time, if the boss was walking by, you'd have to kind of look busy, even yeah. if you weren't specifically in that moment. So I, th I do believe that there's even uh, working from home, this whole element of managers and leaders can now trust that their people are being productive because there's almost the opposite is happening where people are sort of verging on experiencing burnout because I, I think they're overcompensating wanting to demonstrate to their supervisors that, yeah, I really am working. But once people get into that work mode, they really do uh, focus on productivity. So it's kind of a two edged sword there. Yeah. And it's a very mixed bag. Um, if you were developing and empowering your people prior to COVID, that meant that your people understood your vision. They knew where your organisation was going and they had chosen to be a part of the future. A vision statement is simply that. It tells us what will we look like five years from now. Um, and people who have made that choice then start to align their behaviours, their activities, their work life towards the key results that are needed to get to that vision. So for those people, they're really loving this time. But for other people, they were micromanaged. Yes. Um, knowledge is power, so their manager kept power. Um, they counted the number of hours. They counted the number of breaks the person had. They counted... Uh, managers are good at counting. Uh, <laughs> uh, and what happened is that once those people got home, they found that they weren't empowered. That is that they didn't have authority to make a decision. So now they had to email their boss and wait for a decision. They didn't uh, know what was important, so they just tried to look busy. Quick, the boss is checking, look busy. Um, so we're, we're actually seeing a divergence in the workplaces. And what we're actually seeing is those empowering workplaces are getting stronger and are going to come out of COVID well ahead of the others. The uh, workplaces that were withholding power uh, that were not uh, talking to their people about what are our strategies, what are the key results we're trying to achieve, uh, what they're finding is they're going backwards because it's time consuming to micromanage from home. So there's a real divergence. Well, we've, we've hit the 15 minute mark and I've actually asked anybody that would like to ask a question to unmute and ask it. Or if you'd just prefer to write it in the chat box, please do so. The fourth tr uh, uh, trend that came through was uh, music, you know, music to, to my ears is that uh, the next trend is they, the appetite for upskilling mm -hmm. has increased. And while um, people were very happy to do digital upskilling, they're also aware that managers need to be upskilled in how to manage people working remotely. And the other thing is soft skills. So mm -hmm. what are the soft skills that you think people now need in the new hybrid culture? Um, I think, um, harking back to point three, uh, emotional intelligence is critical for right. any leader of the future. And it's one of those things that um, it's a never-ending journey. And if you've been putting it off and postponing it and you want to be a leader, you can't do it anymore. You have to get yourself on a good EI course and start to work on those skills. And they include things like self-awareness, uh, knowing what um, pushes your buttons, knowing what your fears are, knowing what's affecting your decision-making, um, self-regulation, 
Um, and that is about being able to choose better emotions. People often say there are good and bad emotions. There's not. Um, anger is neither good or bad. If I'm an Olympic athlete and I fail at a pre-event and that makes me angry with myself, so I work harder and train harder, anger is good. So good leaders harness emotions that help them. But if anger makes me lash out, perhaps I need to change that. And rather than being angry at a person, I could be curious as to why they've done that. Curiosity will get a better response from me than anger. Absolutely. And a question that I'm often asked, and uh, I'd be interested in your answer, is can you actually teach someone to be more emotionally intelligent? I mean, you can teach them about what it means, but will that actually change them or improve them? Um, you can learn what it is. And when you learn what it is, some of us then desire more of it. So then we make a choice to affect our behaviours and change um, in there. So yes, you can learn about emotional intelligence. I'm not sure about teaching it, but you can learn about it. And the smart, the wise and the modern leader is then saying, okay, now what can I do about this? How can I improve this in myself and in others? Well, Pete Edwards has just uh, asked a question. Do you have any recommendations for good EI courses? And of course, uh, Mark teaches it and I have facilitators around the country. We, we deliver it. But um, I'll just give you my recommendation. Harvard Business Review has an incredible series uh, that you can get as a PDF on emotional intelligence, one on self-awareness and empathy, and you can buy them as individual uh, downloads. So that's a really good, robust source of uh, information, which is way beyond the, the very first book that brought, coined the phrase, Daniel Goldman's Emotional Intelligence. But um, uh, can you point people in, in any direction about how they might maybe assess their own emotional intelligence? And I think that's the key. Just start off by assessing it. Um, we, we talk about going on a journey. Um, when I was uh, with the Air Force, I remember doing this amazing program that started off um, uh, on a Sunday afternoon. And we thought, what's this about? And it was just get together, meet the other participants. Um, the course proper starts Monday. And it did start Monday. It was 1 a.m. Monday morning when somebody kicked in my door, put a bag on my head, um, threw me in a truck, drove 14 of us two hours out into the bush, threw us out and they drove away. And that was the beginning of the course. Um, and that whole course was about discovering who am I? Um, we often focus on the journey, but we forget to ask, where am I starting from? So, now, Mark, start I happen to know that you went on to deliver, to be the facilitator for that course every two weeks for about two years. So I didn't know that's what you did. You oh, rolled up. I also didn't want to um, facilitate the facilitators to replace me. So, <laughs> so I didn't know it started with um, get up at one in the morning and we're going to take you to a secret spot with a bag over your head. Oh, one get up. They kicked in the door. Every course we had to replace all the doors. Well, it was a defence, Department of Defence, so there we go. Yeah. That's the sort of thing, a yes. boot camp they do. Some of my corporate clients aren't willing to allow me to start a program that way yet. And for those that are not aware, you know, I've mentioned the first two, which is your uh, self-awareness and your self-regulation, your self-management. Um, but the last two, of course, is social awareness and social management. Um, but if I'm not self-aware, how can I help others? Um, so that's why I say start the journey by just finding out where you're starting from. Get um, uh, an EI um, uh, uh, questionnaire and just find out where am I starting from and then ask two or three trusted friends, colleagues uh, to do it on you as well. See where they think you're starting from. And if you want true honesty, ask your partner. And if you want brutal honesty, ask your children. <laughs> and... If anybody would like uh, an EI questionnaire, there's one we can send that's on PDF. So send it by email. So contact me. Um, and Fuchsia's asking about who would sign up for emotional intelligence um, accreditations. It, I mean, I guess it's like anything. If you're involved in learning and development, it's another... No, Nina, sorry. 
I meant the kicking in of the door and the bag over the head. <laughs> <laughs> I was thanking him for his clarification that, or your clarification that it was the defense department because I was, I was half listening and I was like, oh my goodness, who would sign up for that? And then when you clarified it, I was like, oh, okay. And then I thought, actually, if I got to learn about myself, I might actually sign up for that. So sorry about that. <laughs> it was the Royal Australian Air Force. Yeah. Okay. In, I, in the beginning, I pointed out that Mark uh, was a, a leadership facilitator for the Royal Australian oh, I came in a little bit late, sorry. That's all right. And, and so he used to lead a two-week residential course that went day and evening for two weeks that was taking... What, what level of people would um, start that program? Were they raw recruits or...? Uh, no, they, they generally served a few years and they were coming into their first leadership role Ah. That type of training continued right through till the end of their careers mm -hmm. uh, because I said it's a never-ending journey it's yeah. about yeah. Finding, where am I starting from and where do I want to get to next and next and next and one of the things and that's why your emotional intelligence is so finely tuned Mark because you were the one that had to actually lead people through a self-discovery how many people would be on that course uh, two-week court program? Uh, typically around 15 at a time. Yeah, so 15 people at a time and you're having interviews in the evening, discussing with them one-on-one -on -one their unresourceful behaviours, as they're called, and getting people to to want to change because that, they could see that the only way they can become an officer is to actually develop themselves as a person. So, and of course, by you leading that uh, program, your your insights, in my observation, working with you over 19 or 20 years, is your insights of behaviour and what's motivating people is quite astute. And um, so, hence, we're discussing this. Well, thank today. you. But perhaps you've answered your own question about can people learn? <laughs> <laughs> because I wouldn't call myself gifted. I'd, uh, yeah, call myself educated. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, you, you have very good powers of observation. And I think that's the key with, uh, with emotional intelligence is to open up your eyes to actually observe the nonverbal cues of people. And you see, look, if you, if you think about the model called multiple intelligences, not everybody has a high interpersonal intelligence. And certainly anybody, if you call, say, use the phrase on the spectrum, it's identified that they actually can't pick up non-verbal cues from people in their body language and their facial expression. But if you can cultivate, um, it's just really looking with, well, what, how are they holding their mouth? What's, what is their eye say, eyes saying? And in fact, when we do emotional intelligence workshops, when um, we show these close-up photos of people's eyes and you have to guess, give, you give them four possible emotions and they have to guess which of those four. And this is Cambridge, a Cambridge University study. And anybody can, and anybody wants the, the uh, link to that email me as well, because that's a fascinating one to do. I think I got 26 out of 30, which is sort of high. I would have wanted, you know, higher than that. But uh, uh, some people score fairly lowly on that. So, um, but the Cambridge University is wanting to, uh, as many people from all around the world to do this test so it, uh, it uh, satisfies their, um, their numbers requirements, yeah. I'll just, we'll just finish off because it's come, come to 25 minutes unless anybody has any other questions. Um, number five, the trend number five that I was identified in the report was around workers not having to be the ones that are proactive, having to ask their leaders for these new trends to be put in place. They actually want, uh, if, if they want to keep these people as top talent, and if they want to be considered uh, employers of choice, it's up to the employers now for the organisations to be proactive and to um, instigate moving towards the hybrid culture and productivity versus hours and um, developing the emotional intelligence of their managers, which is, is reflected in their language style. You know, it's like uh, removing the, 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 the tone of blame or distrust that some managers have, you know, prove it to me that you're doing a good job. You know, that that's, has to become a thing of the past.
Yeah, and they really want to be led. They want leaders to lead. And a lot of people don't realise in the word leader is the word lead. Um, don't let your people drive this. Get out there and say to them, we are an employer of choice. Mm. We're going to come out of this ahead um, and we're going to come out having taken the best of what this has given us. Remember that opportunity is risk. And if I take no risk, I receive no opportunity. Yeah, and therefore, it is up to leaders now to actually be proactive and go out there and speak to their people. So I've, I'm a presentation skills coach as president of Queensland uh, Professional Speakers. Um, if anybody wants some professional presentation skills coaching, I can do that for them. It's about taking, taking the, the, uh, the being on the front foot and presenting to people and talking to them about vision. And you can do that on a Zoom meeting just as easily as you can face to face. And it's now saying, look, we've, we, we see the writing on the wall. We see now that we can trust you to do a great job. We now want to bring some um, uh, changes into place. And also one of the key things is, and you, you've, you've delivered a lot of change programs, yeah. Mark, about going to your people with questions rather than with answers. What would you yeah. say about that? Yeah, very much so. You know, when you share problems with people, then they can contribute to solving that. And that is contributing to our future. When you go and tell them what they should do, you're treating them like a child. Yeah, um, but that's, involve them. that is the balance. So while the, the report says they want... Uh, workers want their organisations to be proactive. At the same time, it's about co-creating the, the changes together so that it's not done to them, it's done with them. And there's some great news for everybody out there. Resistance is at an all-time low. Um, when we talk about change, we tend to get four <laughs> groups. We get the proactive, I want change. The, I understand we need change and I just want to go about this cautiously. The, um, the traditionalists, but in the past we haven't done, and then you get the resistors um, in there. Well, resistance is at an all time low. And even the people who were perhaps traditionalists are now recognizing we are changing, we will change. Uh, so the vast majority now, and you will find 90% of your workforce has actually moved to the pro change side. Uh, whereas prior to this, it would have been a 50, 50. That's very interesting. And that's very um, uh, encouraging. Is that, is that music to people's ears? <laughs> Look, we'll finish up now. If you could just pop a few, uh, a keyword in the, um, in the chat box, how would you, uh, what feedback for Mark, Mark and I, and uh, if there are any uh, topics you'd like us to uh, do in the future, because we'll invite Mark back. He's uh, always, uh, always has a, a, an interesting insight and viewpoint on uh, emerging trends in the workplace. So thank you very much, everybody. And thanks for participating. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, See you next time. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.